First of all, welcome everybody to the Club Metaverse podcast. I'm joined uh, today by two-time All-American, Hall of Famer, uh, Miami legend, uh, two-time <laughs> Super Bowl uh, winning, uh, uh, you know, football player champion, member of the perfect season. I mean, I could just go on and on and do a whole podcast just reading your accolades. Television host, Zonka Outdoors was one of my personal favorites. I'm a huge outdoors fan. You know, currently I'm actually in the Florida Keys, so you can imagine that, you know, it's built into my blood. And I've interviewed a lot of folks on this show, but I got to say, Larry, this might be the most nervous I've been. So I apologize well, if, if, I, if I got to ramp up a little bit, but <laughs> I'd love to jump in. What Before we were getting started, you said that the Tush Push play, which was something that everybody claims is this very modern innovation, you have seen signs of it back dating to the 1920s. I'd love to sort of jump into that and hear a little bit more about what you just said there. Well, keep in mind, Mark, uh, by the way, thank you for having me on the show. It's a delight. And we follow you a little bit. We, uh, when I said that we were commenting about the tush push and the new thing and, and, you know, the swarm uh, try to get a first down with, when you lay it on the line. Uh, I remember as a kid hearing about that, I read a book, uh, uh, it's my kind of football fellow wrote it and it was, it was pretty much written about Bronco Nagurski and those guys at that time. And I was just a kid probably in seventh grade or something. And they talked mm -hmm. about the swarm or the, the hump when they'd, they'd all get together and do that. That's, and that's what, when I saw that play today where they mm -hmm. do that on third and two inches or whatever it is, uh, it's kind of a swarm and it's just a mass push. It's really a great situation to get people hurt in, but right, so, right, far, right. so far, knock on wood, the dolphins haven't been hurt in that particular play. They've been hurting everything else, but, they've been hurt that way. but I, I'm, uh, that was what I was referring to. Now I'd have to research that to make sure, but sure, I'm sure. fairly certain that that was an original play back. I'm talking in the time of leather helmets, <laughs> right? Right. right. You know, when it was, uh, when football was really football, uh, you know, it was a definitely a man sport in the situation. That's my goodness. They only played like eight or nine games, but that's all they could. It was so physical, you know, the so, games changed quite a bit. Yeah. And, and you know, that this whole idea of the scrum, right. Of like, kind of like a rugby style sure. of everybody just kind of bumping heads into each other and seeing which mass of humans can move the other mass forward or backwards is as sort of fundamental as football gets. Right. And, and no, probably no player in the history of the NFL or, you know, just to be fair, you can probably say there's three or four players that kind of define that attitude. And you're definitely in that conversation. Um, but if you go all the way back as a young uh, kid growing up in Ohio, which, you know, obviously that's where the Football Hall of Fame is. It has a very strong sort of football, um, you know, uh, um, kind of, you know, DNA to it. How did you first sort of get started in your football journey? I had designs on it from the time that I watched my older brother play for Stowe High School, the Stowe Bulldogs, uh, in probably 1955, right around wow. in there. I was 10 years old, 9 or 10 years old, and got to go to a uh, high school Friday night football game. And I just liked everything about it from where they parked the cars, the concession stand, the cigar smoke on the <laughs> sidelines, the whole schmear. I just thought, now this is a kid that's growing up out in the country in Ohio, lived down a three quarter mile dirt road and, you know, <laughs> didn't get out much. So this was a big night out for me to go to a high school football game under the lights with the announcers. It was I just thought it was where I wanted to be. Mm. And I aspired from that time forward. I aspired in that in that direction. I followed in that direction, and um, just happened to get a coach come in at the right time. Just like in the pros, just like in college, we had a, a very established Ben Schwartzwalder, Second World War hero kind of guy. Mm. That, uh, was just straight ahead in a cloud of dust and uh, kind of Woody Hayes variety, and. Uh, well, it just fit me, and it just one step led to the next step. You know, I, I grew up as a kid, and maybe you can associate with this a little bit, Mark. I, I aspired to get to Alaska. I When I read about mm. Alaska, I just I was just uh, inundated with it. I just wanted to go there as soon as I could. And mm. as soon as I got out of high school, I thought, well, I'm going to leave and go. You know, That's amazing. If I have to hitchhike up there, I'm going to go. 
I'm going to learn a good job on a fishing boat or a shrimp or shrimper. I'm going to, I'm going to do something because I want to be there. You know, that was the land of Davy Crockett of, uh, sure. you know, I'm just the whole dream. I thought it was there, but then I got sidetracked into football. Then I met my soon to be uh, wife and we started a family things. I went to the football lane, took me. Yeah. So I aspired all through my career. I kept looking at Alaska and it kept talking to me, you know, on the wind and uh, finally made it. I put that in the book. Uh, you know, I, 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 it was about the football career, but at the same time, that was part of my career. And football sure. enabled me in the off season to go up to Alaska a little bit. No. So, so the book is, um, is head on, um, you know, available now. It's an incredible read with incredible insights into how your legendary sort of career and life, to your point, um, sort of, uh, you know, shaped together. And I also have my Alaska story. <laughs> I um, I worked very briefly on the show Deadliest Catch and um, as a as a producer on one of the boats. And to be perfectly honest with you, Larry, I lasted 21 days. I, I mean, like the dream of Alaska and the reality of how Alaska it really is is two completely, you know, different things. You know, beautiful country and and just incredible place, um, but also very tough, right? Tough on the mind, tough That's on the it. body. That's exactly it, Mark. You hit it right on the head. You know, Davey, the rest of them all found it out when they got there, you know, <laughs> right. every one of them. It's, it's true. It's the abundantly wild, which you refer to. It's still the same, pristine in some areas. Mm. Some very remote areas, still the same as 200 years ago, but it's also a very tough place to get by. Yeah, very <laughs> it's, tough. It's tough, as beautiful as it is, it's also that tough. And you don't usually find those two things stuck together like that, but there in Alaska, it's that way. And you, you have to have the resources or at least find a way to get the resources mm. to maintain yourself there and stay there. We started doing an outdoor show. It was the only way I could go and see, you know, if you're just going to go up for 10 days or two weeks, certainly you can go to the places and see some of the more remote places, uh, 10 days or two weeks. Uh, you can do it. Not very, very in depth, but you can do it. But to go there and stay there and sustain yourself and mm. make an income, most of us all that weren't born with silver spoons in our mouths have to maintain an income of some description. Sure. <laughs> well, find a way to do that in Alaska. Well, I started doing an outdoor show, and uh, I talk about it in the book. A chapter or two, we spent yeah, that's how I got there too. Was through television, right? Because there's sure, that's absolutely I mean, because just to show up in Alaska and say, "Hey, I'm here." Uh, you're gonna you're gonna freeze your ass off without much to do. <laughs> um, do you fly airplanes by any chance? Are you a pilot? I'm not a pilot. Audrey aspires in that direction. I'm a little more, uh, I'd rather have a very experienced pilot because sure. where you're flying. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how to put this. It's Alaska's laid down as safe as anywhere else. Uh, but there's some remote areas where, you know, it, you're not in touch all the time oh, and to sure. have your coordinates and have where you're going. You know, you need to register that with someone because there's no such thing as continuous radio contact in the remote areas of Alaska. At least I'm talking about 15 years ago when I was there, 20 years ago when I was there, it was not, it was not, it was still out back. And if you went down, they could go and say, okay, well, this is where they said they were going. So we'll look for them along this line. Mm. That kind of thing happens, still happens up there to my knowledge. But back when I was up there, it, uh, you had to register where you were going to be and let people know because it's out back. And when I say out back, you don't see people for four, five, six no. days. You know, my you see more bears than people. And that's not an exaggeration. You literally that's see it. more bears. You know, yeah, it's pristine country. Uh, you, you happen up on game that's only seen or been around a few human beings. They stop yeah. and look at you. When, when a bear raises up and looks at you, kind of cocks his head like he hasn't seen too many humans. Yeah. In his life, you, know? you know, you wonder you know, what kind of bear you are. <laughs> you know, obviously, look, I and I can't wait to dig in on some football talk. But now that we're kind of in the outdoor stuff, um, did you? ever have any close encounters with a with a bear out there because what when, when when i would go out there um the the father of the captain of whose boat i was on on deadliest catch was a pilot and we would fly from homer just across uh, the bay mm -hmm. or the water it was some kind of body of water 
to this area where when the low tide happens in Alaska, and this is something that a lot of people know, but it's the biggest tide shifts on the planet Earth. So it goes from, uh, you know, a full body of water to a gigantic mass of like wet sand and the bears time it. So when they go out to the sand, they start digging into the sand for the clams and the stuff. And you can land uh, a little Cessna right on the beach and just see literally 10, 20 bears just out there walking oh, yeah. around looking for clams. Um, you know, we were armed. Nothing happened. Thank God. Everything was cool. But did you ever have any close encounters with a bear out there? We had several close encounters. Now, when you say close encounter, that uh, <laughs> right. we happened onto each other and kind of fell out of the brush and we're standing there looking at each other. <laughs> Both of us chagrined. Right. <laughs> Both of us excited about, well, what's going to happen next? And Both of us decided to go opposite directions, which is right. good. Right, right, but, right. Uh, you know, only on one occasion did we have a kind of a, a, a mother that had lost a cub and, uh, she was looking to right the wrong, and that got oh, a wow. intense. And uh, we had to make a real effort to stay all close together, put our hands up, and not show any fear. Um, and it's a little bit of a test, you know. You bring camera guys up from lower forty-eight, and we had to sift through quite a few before we found two or three of them that were really uh, hardcore pioneers, if you will. <laughs> that really. Right enjoyed being out there and enjoyed the the uh, challenge to be able to film on location and so remote and be around things you know sleeping in a tent in bear country and remote bear country is uh something you need to you, you got to pay attention to you can't just relax and think that the bears are going to know who you are and why you're there because any percent at any time you have to be constantly ready and um I have to ask this, this popped into my head, but if you can recall the sort of adrenaline rush of seeing that angry mama bear or seeing angry Dick Butkus as a bear <laughs> head to head, which one raised the adrenaline more? Ah. <laughs> uh. I don't mean to minimize Buckus in any capacity, <laughs> but he didn't have the weapons at hand <laughs> that the bear had. But he had some of them. Make no mistake, he had some of them. Uh, Bob Lilly, uh, Alan Page, uh, Joe Green. You know, mm. uh, any of those guys. You know, I had I was blessed because I had a great offensive line. You know, everybody always mm. said, "Oh, you're such a tough ball carrier," and used to run over people. I used to run over the safety. Who weighed right. 180 pounds? All right, <laughs> right. Yeah, let's, be, let's be fair. I was 240. How many All Hall right. of Famers? Three but Hall of you, Famers on that line, right? Well, that's it. When you have yeah. three or four Hall of Famers in front of you on that offensive line, they keep the Bears, the big guys. They keep <laughs> those guys. Now I won't say off of you. They keep them from manhandling you. You mm -hmm. know, for me to run over Joe Green and then go downfield, that just ain't going to happen. So, right. you know, you might get a yard on Joe, you know, drag, and he's going to bring you to the ground. Mm -hmm. But if you can get him just where he's off to the side, just inches either way, anticipating where he's going to go and knowing how to block it and working out the particulars on it, an offensive line coach like Monty Clark we had, he would do that. You know, he blocked for Jimmy Brown. Think about right. that. That guy right. set up our offensive line, and we had three, three or four Hall of Famers up there in front of me. Now you can start looking around, pointing at people and, you know, rubbing your nose and pointing at people and saying, we're coming here and you can still do it. Sure. But without that research and without that coordination, without those horses in front of you, one on one, forget about it, you know, but with that, now we became an operating machine, but that was intense. It was intense both physically, but it was also very intense mentally. Mm. To be able to anticipate down and distance and what was going to happen and what their what their tendencies were for third and one mm. on, on their own 30. You had to keep those in mind. And we had guys with charts that were over there charting that. And we we anticipated what they were probably going to do. And when we were right, it opened it up and I got through and I got to run over the safety. <laughs> that yeah, was, yeah. That was <laughs> what everybody got to see, you know. But the real fact of the matter was they didn't get to see how intricate and how much hard work went into separating those big guys in the inside. You know, what, what when I was growing up, um, I had um, you know, this is like when I'm in 
elementary school, junior high school. My dad got me some football cards and I had a Larry Zonka card. And I remember I would look at your card over and over again. And I, you know, like I saw all your stats and then I saw that, you know, there was one year off in, in 1975, I believe it was 75. And then um, it would keep going and you were with the Giants. But I always saw the Syracuse stuff and that you were drafted um, number eight in the first round. So you had a very, you know, like everybody remembers you, the perfect Dolphin, 39, the big bruising back. But you also had an amazing college career as a two-time All-American over at Syracuse where you got to play it, I believe, with Tom Coughlin, who, who eventually mm -hmm. became, you know, Super Bowl winning head coach, et cetera. Absolutely. Uh, and you were drafted into a Miami Dolphins team. People think of the Dolphins, they're like, oh, you know, Don Shula and stuff. But you actually were drafted into a team with George Wilson as the head coach that didn't have that great offensive line. And you were kind of thrown right into the fire and had a bit of a rough rookie year. What what was that whole experience like coming from being such a successful college a football player to a team that really didn't have much of an identity when you got there. Thank you for saying not much of an identity and not saying that they were a bunch of losers. Right. <laughs> <That's what> we <laughs> were. Uh, we uh, there, Coach Wilson, who had uh, had championship years up at Detroit, mm. had retired from football or was retiring from football. And Joe Robbie talked him into coming down and being the head coach for the new expansion team. And they had a fellow named uh, Joe Thomas, who was a personnel director, who I think did a beautiful job. You know, of course, I'm prejudiced. He drafted me, but he, mm. he also drafted Bob Greasy, traded for Nick Bonacani, put together that championship team. Mm. And then went on, I think he became, uh, worked up at Baltimore. He worked several places after the Dolphins. But he put that together. But then two years into it, but to go back and talk about those first two years when I got, yeah. you know, I had offensive linemen. I, well, let's just put it this way. Sometimes Bob Greasy would try to hand the ball off to me. And the same time I was getting the ball, I would be getting hit by the defense. <laughs> right. so, so you and Bob were, you, you say <laughs> you and Bob came in at the same year or did he come in no, a year he before was a you? year ahead of me? He was a year he, ahead he, of you. Yeah. He was uh, drafted. I would came in in 68. He came in in 67. Mm. And then we traded for Bonacani in 69, I believe. And then we got Don Shula in 1970. And we had a whole lot of horses. And we had a new cowboy that, that knew what he was going to do with those horses. <laughs> and he came in as head coach. And uh, we became a very uh, learned team. Mm. You know, Bob Kuchenberg came in about the same time as Coach Shula, maybe a year after. Uh, Jim Langer. Larry Little, we traded for in 69. Again, Joe Thomas, that personnel director I told you about. I went in his office and said, in 68, and said, we need some offensive line. He said, I've been talking to Larry Little. And I said, the reason I'm in your office is I just ran into Larry Little and Edlin Buick. I was taking my car to be repaired, and he was coming out as I was going in. Larry Little was from downtown Miami. Mm. It was the off season. He was playing for the Chargers. Did a kind of a backup or off and on, off and on first team role. There's rookie year, and when I saw him at Edlin Buick, he blocked. He filled the door when I was right. going in. He was coming out, and we kind of juggled the door. And then I stepped back and opened <laughs> the door and let him walk through. Right, you're six three. I mean, you're a big yeah. guy too. Yeah. Well, I wasn't looking down at him. I was looking up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And I said, who do you play for? And he said, the Chargers. Why? And I said, well, I play for the Dolphins. He said, well, I'm trying to get to the Dolphins. I said, really? <laughs> I left Elon Buick and went straight down to Joe Thomas's office on downtown Miami, up on the third floor. Walked in there and said, have you ever heard of a guy named Larry Little? He said, well, I'm trying to get him. I said, Joe, let me put it to you so we understand each other. I said, if you get Larry Little, that's great. And I said, but you, if you don't, we're on the third floor and I'm going to throw you out that window right there. Right. I said, you've got a promise. He said, what sold you so much? I said, if nothing else. He's big enough. I can hide behind him. <laughs> he just looks, talks and walks like a, like a natural athlete. And I said, I can appreciate it. I had great linemen at Syracuse. I've been run, I run behind a few of them. He is definitely moves like what I think he said, you, you're that sold. I said, absolutely. And he, uh, I don't think I influenced. I think Joe was about to do that anyway, but mm. he brought 
certainly he acquired all the talent, including myself. So, you know, I don't want to take credit from Joe because he, he was already down going down. Right, you were recruiting. You were instrumental. Well, I was just condoning. <laughs> He's got <laughs> right. an idea of Larry Little. And Larry Little's another Hall of Famer. You know, just uh, he never missed a block, you know. So how, how did it, like, do you have any sort of memory, um, and you have so many of these great insights in the book um, uh, head on, and and it was just kind of a, I thought, look, I'm a huge Miami Dolphins diehard fan. I look forward to the Dolphins winning every weekend, primarily because you are the voice of reason as a Dolphin fan on social media. And it's such a kind of a surreal experience to get to chat with you real time, because like after every game, I look forward to what's your thought on the game, win or lose. You always have the most calm perspective about the Dolphins game. So to me, it's as a fan, it's amazing how involved you actually are still with the Dolphins um, as a kind of a mindset, you know? And, you know, to me, it's a fascinating idea. What was that kind of reaction when uh, Wilson is out, Shula is in? What did you, Larry Zonka, think? Were you excited about it? Were you a little you know, a uh, little worried about it. I mean, he obviously came, comes in f- f- with, with a big name, had just taken the Colts to the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, Don Shula was a known quantity. Um, mm. What 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 was your kind of reaction? My reaction at first was I'm probably going to be on the first train out of, out of Dodge here, out of Miami. <laughs> wow, wow. Because look back at his history. Mm. In 1970, historically, he had had 220 pounds. His largest running back was like 220 pounds. Mm. There I am at 240, a power runner, and he doesn't really fit that bill from where he's coming. You know, his teams weren't weren't uh, recognized or defined by a power control football uh, situation. Vince Lombardi's wa- wa- were right had that signature. Uh, there were several other coaches, uh, the name slipped my mind at the moment, but they they had that signature of ball control offense and coordinated offensive line, you know, much like the Cleveland Browns, Paul Brown, same thing. Mm. They threw the ball occasionally, but not, not consistently like they do today. Of course, the rules have changed. But here comes Don Shula, and I'm looking, well, what big running back has Don Shula ever had? And I couldn't find any. So I figure I'm on the next bus out of Dodge. You know, it's <laughs> going to happen here. And I'm hoping I get traded up to Green Bay or someplace that has a power running game. So I go in, to, you know, after the meeting, he said, you know, in front of the, in front of the, the uh, troops, in front of the uh, players, I want uh, you call me coach. You know, when you come in my office, you shut the door. I'm Don. You're Larry, whoever you whoever you are. Mm. It's a first name basis, all that. But you know, in front of the team, he demanded respect. Mm, that's and interesting. That comes in some interesting things have happened this last Super Bowl. So that's changed. That atmosphere has changed. We'll yeah, 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 yeah. We'll get back to that. Yeah, we'll get back to that. Yeah, I go into his office and say, "Okay, I shut the door. I say, okay, Don. You know, nice to meet you. My name's Larry. I, you know, I'm probably going to be on the first train out of here. You know, I said, why is that? I said, well. I said, I, you know, I looked at your history. I said, I, I, to be honest with you, Coach, I, I don't like you very much. Wow. <laughs> and he said, well, what have I got to lose? Think about it. He's never had a power running game at my Baltimore. He's a winning coach coming there. He's got Johnny Unitas that threw the ball up there. Mm. Anyway, you know, his, he wasn't – everybody had more of a running game back then because they ran the ball more. But that, sure. he wasn't – he was leaning towards the passing game, obviously. Right, right. At the highest level. Sure. So my future did not look bright. What have I got to lose? I just want to get down to the facts and we'll, we'll go from there. And he said, well, sit. he said, that's nice to hear. Sit down. He said, because I don't care for you much either. He said, oh, so wow. That's something in common. And, <laughs> you know, that broke the ice, though. That's see, that's, that's amazing. When you go in and set the stage like that, you know, I didn't say it in a disgusting manner. I didn't say it. In a, you know, I just said, I, I, I don't like you very much because, I, you know, I don't see how I'm going to fit into this thing and he said well you know it's still early we want to take a look at that he said uh, but you know as far as asking about a trade he said i looked into that i looked in it for everyone he says i can't get much for you so <laughs> <laughs> sad but true there it is <laughs> at that time i wasn't worth very much and it wasn't worth the trade but then 
when I learned that Monty Clark was going to be our offensive line coach, you know, mm. a guy that I watched play as a kid at the Browns uh, up by Cleveland. Ah, uh, so, you know, then I, next thing I see Bob Kuchenberg lining up, you know, he's a trade, you know, free agent came into camp, Jim Langer, you know, the, Larry Little's already there and they're starting to get me to the side and say, okay, we're going to have our guards pull and we're going to trap people. And we're going to, and I'm starting to see that familiar offense that I saw with the Browns when they would mm. trap people and do things. Now, now you couldn't have blown me out of there with dynamite. I wanted to stay right there, buddy. I wow. was right on the Johnny on the spot. But that's how the relationship started with Shula. And I think the difference is he he was very down to earth. When you went into the office and shut the door, it was Larry and Don. And, you know, you talked about and if you wanted to cuss and scream, he'd cuss and scream, too. You know, he didn't care. Right. He, was, uh, he wasn't afraid of much of anything in uh, ex ball player himself. And he knew it was about the details and you know, the the edge of being prepared. He knew Mm. that that's what, you know, and he demanded that respect as the head coach. And I see shivers of that Kansas city. I saw some things there. I didn't like, I see a, I see a Mm. crack in the footer, you know, uh, that can't work. You know, that's gotta be rectified. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's yeah. That, that whole thing was, especially because Andy Reid seems like such a, a, sort of supportive head coach, right? That always, you know, always seems to have his players back, always seems to sort of put people in the right position to win. That seemed a little bit out of sorts. And this whole, look, to be perfectly honest with you, this whole season, that team, I never thought was the best team in football. And even at the end of that game, I still was like, this isn't the best team in football. Mm. I can't remember the last time, that a team has won the Super Bowl with maybe the Giants against the Patriots that one year that they saved us, where, where I'm like, that's the best team in football. This year, I didn't really get that feeling, right? Like, at any point in the season, you know? Like, yeah, I was like, oh, funny. you know. It was kind of hit or miss, particularly early in the season. Now, you look at the Dolphins. We're winning everything early in the season. Just trying sure. to be number one seed. We're all this, and all of a sudden, bingo. We drive off the edge of the cliff. People get hurt. People make mistakes. Dropping the ball, losing the ball inside the 10 yard line, the positive the plus 10 yard line. My goodness, I saw things that just were considered mortal sins when we played. You know, the, that Titans you have your attention to lose control of the ball on a hand, you know, in a situation like that. That's something that you use as seed for the next year and you plant that seed and grow that plant back up. And then you never forget that. You know, when we mm. lost at the hands of Dallas in Super Bowl, what was that six, I guess. Right, right. The one before the perfect season. Yeah. Yeah. That served. Well, that's why that happened is that was the ultimate insult, you Mm -hmm. know, to what we had accomplished that entire season of 71 going in there and then to lose to them in that Super Bowl, you know, to just be body slammed by Dallas. It was bad. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of shriveling from that, you use that as the seed to grow. Mm. And the perfect season grew out of that dynamic, that losing dynamic of being so embarrassed mm. by what we had done in Super Bowl VI that we came back with a perfect season. Not many people have that kind of regroup power, have that kind right. of discipline and, and just tenacity. It became, you know, I'll never forget after we won the final game in Super Bowl Seven and beat the Redskins, and Jake Scott comes in the locker room, stands up on it, and gave him the ball, a team ball, of course, the game ball. MVP of that game. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Three interceptions, major interceptions, pre- critical times. Mm. Went out of position one time, way out of position to do what Number 13 for the young Dolphin fans that don't know. Stood Jake up Scott. on the bench and held up the ball and looked at all of us, and he said, his ending remark was, I don't think any one of us in this room realize what we just did. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and that's, you know, that was the marker. That That's when people say to me, you know, the perfect season, I think back of Jake standing on that bench saying, none of us realize what we just did. We've been so engulfed, so just overindulgent in the fact that no detail was going to go un, un, unnoticed. Mm. You know, we dissected it every which of way and were attentive. Shula would stop practice on the field and talk about a mistake that was made. We'd all look at it, realize it, reason it, and put it in our heads that it isn't going to happen again. Now, to go one game like that or go to the playoffs, that's one thing. 
But to do an entire season with that kind of total attention to detail, you know, he called it the winning edge. It's on the Super Bowl ring that they gave us mm. or that he put together and that they, the league gave us. But it, 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 it recognizes that attention to the smallest details. You have to be there. You know, if you've got to weigh in on, on Thursday morning at 237 pounds and you get up and you're 239, you go down to the field, you put on the rubber gear and you run for an hour yeah, so yeah. you can lose two pounds or a half hour, whatever it takes to get on the scale. That's called, that's self-discipline. That's part of that same schedule mm -hmm. that I'm talking about. For a coach to be able to keep a team on the on that winning edge, on the sharp sharpness of that point for an entire run of, you know, 17 plus games. Mm. That's, uh, it's unreal. You know, you say, well, that's a perfect, that's the only time that ever happened. It doesn't matter whether you're playing eight games or you're playing 28 games. Mm. Perfect is still perfect. You know, 1,000%. So yeah. You know, I – I had uh, Mercury Morris, um, your your backfield, uh, you know, running back uh, partner, um, on the show, and I asked him this question because, as a fan, it's something that I've always thought about: is the the Dolphins in 1972, 16 and 0, heading into the Super Bowl, and up until the very end of the game, you guys were also potentially going to have a shutout in the Super Bowl. You were up 14 to nothing, and it was going to be a shutout. And of course, we all know Gary Yapremian has the uh, mishap, throws the interception, gets run back for a touchdown. Um, Mercury told me that he didn't give a crap about that play; that it's a you know non-factor. Were is that how you felt about it too, or, or or were you like, damn, we we almost had that thing? And you know, um, was that any? Did that affect the locker room in any way after the game that you guys almost Any went time. perfect season shutout? Anytime that you have a situation where it's all one-sided and then you get right down to the closing minutes of the fourth quarter <laughs> and, you know, suddenly it turns into a very close game, you know, it's 14, seven and, uh, you know, that got everyone's attention. So if what, what that, what happened from that point on is our defense rose to the occasion, the offense mm -hmm. went on the field and had to punt. You know, much to my chagrin. Uh, by the way, kicking that field goal was much to my chagrin as well. It was, uh, mm. you know, just inches. We could. I wanted to power it and uh, continue the continue the romp, but you don't. Ch you know, it's his decision. That's what he decided. He called for the field goal, and mm. you know, seven. <laughs> <laughs> 14 because what it was third and inches it was third and inches i i it's 14 to nothing and uh and we were going to try to uh well it's a long story but it, it, he <laughs> right. you know it was just short it was just inches and you know i thought we could i didn't want to punt i wanted to go for it right and uh or go, not go for the field goal i wanted to go for it and uh of course he decided against that and we and we did but that our defense rose to the occasion mm -hmm. you know that's when i'm I talk about you know the defense is when defense gives plays perfect they go out for three plays and come off the field the offense plays perfect they go out for 30 plays they work their, or 13 plays and work their way all the way down the field and score mm -hmm. so you see much more of the offensive players on a very winning team so it's natural to always center around the offense. But the strength of the 72 team was the fact that we had Fernandez and Scott and Stanfield, all those people handing us that ball back every three or four or five plays. Yeah. That, that was the supreme changing thing um, from, from one year to the next one. We went, lost the Super Bowl and came back and had a perfect season. That defense stood up and was counted on. They did their job, and they went out on that field and did the job and stopped that from turning around. I can't but help to think of oh, – I'm sorry to if, interrupt. Go ahead. If, if Shula kicks the field goal, it makes it 17 to nothing in a 17-0 season. Right. Now, oh, all right. wow. All I right. Oh, wait, a minute. wait a minute. Let me finish. <laughs> yeah. Remember that talk about the winning edge and doing what we really do, you know, not getting – See, he got a little artistic, right. in my opinion, and like that 17 and 0 thing and 17 0 is destiny. Instead, it gets blocked and it's 14 7. Right. right? It, well, it gets blocked, but then Gerald tries to throw a pass. Yeah. 
you know, yeah. uh, you couldn't ask for a worse situation than Gary <laughs> Premium trying to throw a pass. He is left handed. He threw it with his right hand. Can it get any worse? All right. Turned into seven points. All right. The other way. Now yeah. we're from 17 and 0 and dressing the turkey and sitting down to dinner to fighting for a place at the table. You know, sure. in those closing minutes, that's the point I wanted to make. It wasn't our offense. It was our defense mm. that saved the day. The you bring up this is a very I think a, a very a powerful analogy between the mindset that your team had in that situation, third and inches, the best power running back in the NFL, the best offensive line in the NFL. Um, you ex probably expressing to your head coach, "Give me the ball, coach. I'll get you this first down. We'll keep going." Um, the coach deciding something else, but you maintaining that level of respect versus what we saw in this last Super Bowl. What what's the mindset that you kind of have to train yourself to 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 do to make the right mature decision in that kind of high tense moment? Anytime you have a group of athletes that want to accomplish a goal, it's got to come down to strategy and putting your best athletes at the best points of contention. That has to be a decision by one entity. There has to be a fella in charge. If you're planning a battle at war where people die, mm. there has to be one guy that sits down with all the details and decides this is the way we're going to do it. Now, he may have all kinds of lieutenants that give him ideas, but finally you have to have one guy that says we're going to do it this way. We can't have part of this way, part of that way. Part. We're going to do it this way. There has The buck has to stop there. Mm. For a military to operate, any kind of team sport to operate, you have to have that commander. Now, the only way you can have that commander is with power and is with respect. Because if you lose either, either the power or the respect, in any, in any dimension, at any time during the game, it starts to put a crack in your armor. Mm -hmm. If that's tolerated and becomes a, a factor, it grows into a cancer and destroys the team mm -hmm. or destroys the group is a better team. Forget about team. We're talking about military and team sports. Sure, You're talking about unit. the same kind of approach. Now, I know one, <laughs> one's a pastime and one's, you know, real world for life. All right? Sure. You can die on a military thing. Not many people die on a football field. It's a sport. I understand. Mm -hmm. But you have to have that similar discipline and respect because there can be only one head coach. Mm. All the other assistants, you can have 29 other assistants. That doesn't matter. But the buck stops here. Mm. This guy makes the final. He decides whether we kick the field goal, whether we go for the first down. Now, you might have another opinion, but you keep that to yourself on the field. In his office, if you want to go in and lay it all down, many times, Shula and I were, you know, I'd holler right back at him in his office. I never once ever hollered at him in front of the team. You don't do that. Mm. You don't, you don't holler at your, your commanding general. <laughs> Not right. More than once, you know, For sure. you get traded or you put away, or you get put in jail. You know, that's the way it is. <laughs> in military, it's certainly that way. And in, in team sports, that has to be out of the will to win. You have to accept that that, okay, I'm not going to be the featured guy all the time. Sometimes I'm better off on the bench and someone else is better off in there in the down and distance situation. So that has to be there. That Not just listening to that, but the respect of it. Mm. Not You don't have to respect the man, but you've got to respect the position. He is sure. the head coach. So it stops right there or your team falls apart. Mm. See, it's not a question of one guy, well, he's always like that. no. If you have one guy showing disrespect to the head coach in a demeaning manner, uh, it it weakens the entire team because that can't be put up with, mm. uh, in my opinion. Now, yeah. I realize, you know, that's the way. No, no, I no. It's it. very true. It's the very powerful. You know, but very powerful. The same, hits time, hard. the same time the game hasn't changed in some respects. You still yeah. have to have one guy making the decision and you got to show him the respect. And when you don't, particularly in public, in front of people, 
Now, now you got a problem. Now there's yeah. a crack in the armor. See, so the the Miami Dolphins, you know, create the only perfect season of all time. Next year, you guys, 1973, you basically have the the whole team back together. You guys beat the crap out of the, uh, well, you know, you beat them good, the San Francisco 49ers. Game two of 1973, you guys suffer your first loss in the, uh, what what is that, 19 games? Um, right. What right. was that like as a team? Like when you guys <laughs> had to travel across the country, which back then probably must have been very different than traveling across the country now. You got to go play in Oakland against a tough Raiders team. You drop that one. What was that like in the locker room? I think um, it, we hadn't learned to handle defeat very well. Some of the rookies <laughs> had never had it, you know, for the for the entire season in '72, and then two games, excuse me, into the '73 uh, season, and it was kind of a shock and a little bit of a downer. But at the same time. It was getting to be, we were getting to be so much of a target mm. from week to week. Teams that shouldn't have played that well against us were playing their best game ever. Mm. So if there was ever a silver lining to anything, it was like uh, maybe we want that monkey off our back with just one loss. You know, it's just sure. nice to entertain the thought of going two seasons undefeated, but let's get real. Right. I don't think we were capable of that, and we didn't. We didn't make it. So the best thing was drop one early, and then rip off yeah. like ten in a row, I believe, or nine in a row. I don't know what it was, we yeah, but it was good. We, we were dominating, but we weren't undefeated anymore. But that got to be a thing where teams that shouldn't be giving us a good game or shouldn't be uh, bringing us down to the wire were playing way over their heads just because they use that as an incentive to get up and get um, mentally up uh, charged to play the game, to play better than they usually did mm. just because they were playing against us. So you start to create a, uh, an illusion <laughs> that other people, it causes them to, to, to play above their, their, what they usually do. Uh, and that uh, was in that, in that, in that situation, in that, uh, way of looking at it it was kind of a relief to lose one so we could go on and now people weren't weren't going to play you know they weren't going to come screaming out of the stands you know was that, was that the case because they were playing the all-time greatest team ever you know and, and you don't have to answer this but i'm just so fascinated by those details do you remember was that kind of coaches uh speak like post post game speech was we got that out of the way let's move on Type that of thing. Exactly, exactly what Don Shula said. He said he got up in front of us and said, Well, we knew sooner or later it had to happen. Now it's happened. Now we use it, use this to feed on to that's over with. Now let's get back. We don't have to be defending the undefeated thing anymore. We're just playing the game to win it. Mm. <clears throat> We're not protecting the, the diamond mountain anymore we're protect we're going back to to win another championship let's rear let's gear down and get serious about what we're going to do that monkey's off our back it's dead gone it's it's history now mm -hmm. let's win let's go back to the super bowl and that brought a round of uh a cheer from the right. team and which and you did you you only lost one more game that season i forget exactly against who it was towards the end of the season but you had a great playoff run and beat the crap out of the Minnesota Vikings, 24 to seven, I believe the score was. And mm -hmm. you guys were back to back uh, uh, champions. Was that was that second Super Bowl? Did it feel like one gigantic run on sentence from the you know from the Dallas Cowboys to the Minnesota Vikings? Was was that one gigantic season? I mean, it seems exhausting just thinking about it the run that you guys went on from 1970 to 1973 must have been absolutely exhausting. Yes and no. Mm. Um, exhausting in the sense of the excitement of the thrill of being at the top. Cause you're talking about a team in 1969 and 70 was just trying to get to the playoffs. You know, <laughs> right. Right. Time ever, you know, winning season. My goodness, we're coming from nothing to everything. And now we're at the top of the hunt and, you know, it, it, it was a really wild ride to do that in such a short time. Sure. The same group of people 
was right. um, was it was a really fun trip. <laughs> I mean, I really it, uh, it's a high point. It was a high point of our career at the time, and we realized it. You know, that's I think if the we discovered uh, through through going back and looking at the the play sheets. Mm. how few mental errors were made mm. <laughs> and uh, my goodness our defensive unit and you know they had like three between three and six mental errors where they were in half of one alignment half of another you know major error that happened three or four times in the course of an entire season it's amazing now, you know people do that in the course of a game sure now, you think about that. How do you get that many people that in tune with what's happening, mm. where they're all the same heartbeat? You follow me? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the rarity of the moment. Sure. And I think that comes down to initiative, which was we had a coach that showed us we can win. We got the Super Bowl and got our butt kicked. He brings us back and shows us more attention to detail. You know, he doesn't harass us about being up and hollering and screaming and running onto the field to kill someone. No, he wants us cool, calm, and collected. Mm. But we want to win. We will not accept defeat. We're going to find some way to win. Somehow, some way, one of us is going to make it or break it. All right? Mm. And Cleveland game in 72. You know, Cleveland's got the upper hand. They're, they're looking like they're going to take it. Mm. And then Charlie Babb, a backup defensive corner, first or second year guy, not only says he spot a weakness on the punter, comes to the coach, the coach tells him, you you see it, take it. He mm. said, but you're going, we better win if you're going home with us. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so Charlie, a second year player, takes the shot, blocks the punt, picks it up, runs it in the end zone. A backup player makes the difference. See, that's the greatest thing about it. Well, look at Earl Morrill, right? Your, yeah. your close friend yeah. and sure. without, without Earl who came with coach from, from uh, Indianapolis. I'm sorry. And wanted to, from Baltimore. From Baltimore. Sorry. He wanted to retire. Sorry. He tried to retire at Baltimore. They talked him into one more year. Then Shula goes to Miami. He's for sure going to retire. Shula calls him up, says, uh, -uh I want you down here. <laughs> right. Right. So Earl Let's, comes down with us. We got him a rocking chair and put it in front of his face. So <laughs> Let me ask you one, one random question. And you've been so generous with your time. I know I'm running out of time here. So there's only three things in my mind that I've been dreaming about for a few days asking you, um, when you think about the Orange Bowl, what's the first image that pops into your head? The 50-yard line. The 50-yard line. I love huh? to stand on the – when you came in from the parking lot, and the parking lot was a treat because all the fans – we all parked together. Right, right. So early right fans, in the middle of the city. The I, greatest, yeah. One of the greatest things about the Orange Bowl is where it was located. It was in a part of the city where a lot of poor folks that were in downtown Miami, and that was not a glorious place to be, mm -hmm. you know, as far as in South Florida and all the hup up. It, it, it'd be in that was kind of a ghetto area, and it was just that's what it was. It was fashion, yeah, yeah, yeah. biracial, tenant or whatever. And but that Orange Bowl was like a gathering point right in the middle of that. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we have something that everybody's interested in. Sure. You know, it's, a, it's a sideline thing. It's sports, but it brought a lot of people together. And the excitement, I started to say, you know, was coming in and parking in the parking lot and all the kids from that surrounding area. There was a black area. There was a Spanish area. There was, you know, everybody had an ethnic area there mm -hmm. and they were all sequestered off and they didn't cross on each other, all that kind of crap. But then on game day, it was just a mass of humanity. And from the time mm. we got out of the car in the parking lot, and many of the other players will tell you this, we used to gather up two or three of those kids because we, the, the, the people that guarded the, the uh, Orange Bowl were buddies of ours on the team. Mm. So our team members, we could take a kid or two and walk them through the gate, turn them loose in there. And they got to go in and stay up in the thing and see the game. And sometimes you slip them a couple bucks, you know, to get a hot chocolate or something. That's that awesome. was a community. See, that kind of thing there. It was a place to come together where it was all a Miami against whoever we were playing. You know? Right, right. And it was for something to show a little 
camaraderie between the different factions that were all down there at the Orange Bowl. Now, when you talk sure. about the Orange Bowl itself, to walk out there at the 50-yard line, you know, to, for the kickoff, when they just would roar so loud, you could not, I'm telling you, you put your chin strap on and you could feel your helmet vibrate. Oh, that's incredible. The field when they holler, it was so close. You know, they build stadiums yeah, yeah. different now. But that was so unique. It was such a unique place and such a place of blending of mm. uh, our Miami fans. Some were black, some were brown, some were Spanish, some were Italian. It, we had a cross blend. We were the most uh, fun thing in town, and it crossed all those barriers. Yeah. Something to be enthusiastic, and it brought, it brought a kind of a unity in the, one of the deepest, darkest parts of the town, where it was probably the most segregated by area. Yeah. Uh, it was right in the heart of that. And I got such a kick out of that at the time because all of us would, Mercury, Jim Kick, uh, you know, Rest Nick peace. Bonacani, we'd all grab a kid or two and take him in the game, you know, and give him a couple bucks. And it, it was kind of fun because you got to know some of those folks down there. And you got yeah. to know them on the first main basis. And it was a real community. It was a real, it was yeah, a real yeah. gathering place for the city. Yeah. It took a community that was all quadrant off and put a central theme in the middle that they could all come to. Now, couldn't we learn something today? You know, mm. I mean, things are a lot better. I, I understand time has gone by and things have gotten better. Uh, but it's that same thing. If we could all get that excited about being Americans, you know, just, to, I just agree. because we're a unique place in the world, you know. And that's how I see uh, our country is just like I used to see the old Orange Bowl. You know, mm. we're the last bastion of where everybody's got an opinion and it counts. So it's kind of unique. Amen. Amen. Just to fast forward a little bit, because I know I'm running out of time. And again, thank you so much for your generosity. Um, in 1980, I believe it's 1987, you get inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And I'll never forget this because it's the kind of thing that, you know, you hear once and then you think about every single time um, you hear your name or think about your name is... Um, that you wish your dad had called you Larry Zonka with a Z so that you would be the last person um, to give, you know, their speech. And then, like, I had never realized CS does kind of sound like Z. Anyway, that's a, <laughs> that's a tiny little detail for weird, hardcore Dolphin fans. But in 1987, when you become a Hall of Famer, there's a young man who's already become a huge star in Miami with Dan Marino. Did you and Dan... Um, you know, you kind of as like the, you know, the elder statesman of greatness for the team. Do you remember, you know, ever mentoring Dan as a young man when, when he was starting to come up with the Dolphins? I wasn't around much when Dan was there. Um, mm. I, you know, I finished uh, my last year and I think he came the second season after I left. Uh, mm. I <laughs> departed. Uh an elderly statesman <laughs> went on my journey towards Alaska. Sure. And I didn't really come back. I watched, certainly kept track of and had opportunities to meet with Dan Marino, but I never offered him any advice or coaching. Sure. I, sure. I, I'm not uh, a coach by nature. I know. You're a, a fan. Coach. I mean, you're definitely a, a fan. A coach team had sure. to fit where it had to fit. And I saw Dan fitting into that. I think where, uh, where the Dolphins were deficient. And then you go back and look at the stats during the course of his career. I know. He was extremely capable of getting the ball down to the edge of the end zone right away. Mm. <laughs> but the worst thing that could happen to him, in my opinion now, this is an old fullback talking now, <laughs> uh, was for the Dolphins to get a first down inside the 10-yard line back then because they depended on their passing oh, game God. so much and they didn't have much of a power running game. Right. You know, to kind of power that thing in where we excelled in 72 and 73 was, you know, third and short was look out because, you know, here it comes. And, you know, how's how is it going to get you By right straight on or crisscross or, you know, <laughs> we had so many right. different unique things. You had Mercury Morris, Jim Kick, myself, you know, there's two or three different things that could happen there. And when we would crisscross and Dreezy would turn around, who's he going to hand it to? Sure. You know, those kind of things. I did not see the Dolphins having that capability when Dan was there. Mm. I felt bad for him because he could get it down there, 
but then they always settled for the field goal. And it just, it turned into a games of where it was just a tiny bit that made mm. the difference several times. And I felt bad for him in that respect. Did I ever talk him or mint, talk to him or mentor him or chant? No, I did not. Dan mm. Marino had far better minds than mine <laughs> to mm. listen to. And he, he was a great, great player and a hall of famer. And, uh, Unfortunately, just uh, they were just a little bit short. Uh, I think the uh, you know I I center it down to the thing that I like to identify with most, which is third and short or goal line situations. Right. It was more than that, but at the same time, that would have made a great difference. You know, there were some things on the defense that could have been could have been a little better under some of those circumstances. But at the same time. That was all different coaches, all different. There was a different method. You know, the great thing about the NFL, or maybe not so great thing for ex-players, but great thing about it for those fans is that it constantly changes. The rules change. Mm. You know, if you go back and look at the passing game during my tenure, you know, uh, you had to be tough to get downfield just to catch the ball. (laughs) Because until the ball was in the air, the receiver could be knocked off his feet back then. Right. Right, right. Now, you can't touch that guy from the time he crossed the line of scrimmage. So you can't interfere with his route, you know. And uh, so it's that's a that's a great that's a magnificent difference. And so it really enhanced the passing game. So now you see, well, you boil that down. Why did they do that? Well, if you see a play take place where a guy runs with a football and he runs up through a crowd of people and you can't even see him for a moment, he pops out the back and you're cheering because he's for your team, but you don't know how he got through there. Mm. See, all that intricate blocking and understanding and and uh, communication between those offensive players to do that in that mass of humanity and get through there is a really strategic, tough thing to do. Mm. But you don't have appreciate it because you can't understand it because you can't really even see it. Right. But if you see a quarterback throw the ball 40 yards downfield, receiver catches it in his hands. Do you understand that? Mm. Which one as a fan would you cheer more for? You know, right. the excitement right. of seeing that ball going through the air or losing a guy with the ball through a mass of humanity and popping out mm-hmm. the other side. Certainly you're glad in both cases, but it was so exciting because sure. you witnessed the whole thing and understood it in one respect. So it, advancing the passing game makes sense and it makes it more entertaining for the fans without mm-hmm. having to have so much understanding of, of what's happening on the field. So I understand why it went that way. They pay to get through the gate. It's a business. But at the same time, the enthusiasm was is is great there. Mm. But sometimes that passing game comes down to third and one, or third and two feet on the two feet line on the two foot line at the end zone. Right. And if you can't get it in there, <laughs> if you all can't right, right. pass is getting there don't mean much. <laughs> there it is. So last question. And I'd love to talk about the modern day Dolphins only because I know that you follow them extremely closely and you're a, you're 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 still a huge student of the game. But this is my last question. I noticed that you're wearing your Super Bowl, um, your your 1972 ring, which is really awesome. What what choice did you make in your head to switch between the uh, the 72 ring versus the 73 ring? I think when we achieved perfection and they gave us the rings and I put it on my hand, I just never took it off. <laughs> it didn't matter it's what a else. Perfect I've answer. Got, I've got a 73 win and I've got a 70 win from, you know, but I've got uh, the Hall of Fame rings and things. I, I just, that ring, that was something that I'm extremely proud to have been a part of. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, by wearing that ring, it, not only celebrates it for me, but it celebrates it for everybody on the team. And because it's unique, you know, it's very unique and not just unique for, for the time I played, but unique for the history of football. Sure. Well, the kid I put in the book about meeting uh, uh, Bronco Nagurski at the hall. When they announced the hall up in Ohio, I snuck in got thrown out a couple of times, snuck back in. <laughs> I've been throwing out more than I've been inducted. <laughs> <laughs> got up next to Bronco and was standing there just studying him. And then years later, met him again and talked about it. He said he remembered, I don't know if he did or not, but the thrill of that, the thrill of the history, then to have been lucky enough to be a part of unique history 
the sure. only undefeated team. That kind of goes along with why I was at the Hall of Fame and everything. I thought that was extremely unique to be there when they dedicated the hall mm. and see Bronco Nagurski standing out front as a 10, 11 year old kid, 11, 12 year old kid, whatever I was, was a real thrill. Then to know that I figure in the history by being part of that team that was the greatest team of the first 100 years, it just all kind of, all kinds of, all sort of comes together for me. Mm. You know? And I, uh, I like that. I like that too. I'm a huge fan of Mr. Zonka. Thank you so much for your time. The book is head on. I'll put the links down below. Um, uh, check it out. It, it's some incredible insights, like some of the ones that we've touched on today. Um, Larry, thank you so much. This has been like, uh, I mean, I'm a diehard Dolphin fan, and <laughs> you've been part of my life as as a hero for pretty much all of it, and this has been a, a, an incredible honor. So thank you very much. Likewise, Mark. Good talking to you. Anytime. All right. Bye-bye, guys. Thank bye. you all, and talk to you soon. Bye.